Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the fifth event in the 2022 Healthy Working Life Seminar Series. Today's topic is a truck driver's perspective of staying healthy on the road. I'm Dr. Tingxia, a research fellow from the Driving Health Research Team at Monash University, and I will be your MC for today. I would like to welcome all of you to this seminar. It's, it's our privilege to have you with us today. We acknowledge the scale land of the Wurundjeri people on which we are based and pay our respect to the thousands of years of wisdom and knowledge found with the indigenous owner of the land, Uma Jika, today. In today's seminar, we have Driving Health Research Fellow, Dr. Dr. Elizabeth Pritchard from Monash University, Rod Hannifin, who is a truck driver and Aussie, Aussie Help Ambassador, and Trevi Warner, who is also a truck driver and vice president of National Road Rights Association. Elizabeth will do a short presentation first around the driving house findings related to this topic, followed by a discussion with our panel member. There will be a Q&A session at the end of this session. And but throughout the seminar, you can submit questions through the ask a question button below your live stream screen at any time. Over to you, Elizabeth. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Ting, for the introduction and welcome again to this final week of the Driving Health Seminars. It's exciting to be here with you today. So I'm going to share a little bit of some about some of the interview data that we had around uh, the interviews that I did with people and drivers and family members and give you a little bit of an overview around that. So to start with, as we said, the um, we're going to have uh, some research findings very briefly and then we've got this wonderful discussion with a couple of amazing professional truck drivers and time for Q&A going forward. So just to give you a little bit of a background about the driving health it's been a three-year study, and we, we were also involved a couple of years before that, but the, the findings today are around the last three years, which has been a partnership between the industry, the trade workers' union, and also the government in the funding at, um, of the study. And so we've had a collection of, of studies that have looked at workers' compensation claims, life insurance data, online survey, telephone survey, and today I'm going to give you a little bit more information around the in-depth interviews that we've had with drivers and family members. So I interviewed 17 drivers and nine family members across different states in Australia. And the aim of that was to identify and explore the factors that were influencing either in a way of supporting or creating a risk for the health and well-being of the drivers across Australia from their perspective and also family members' perspective. And it was great because we were able to look at what were the connections, what were the things that were uh, causing uh, challenges for both sides of people, and also if there were any differences between the, the groups as well. So what rose from that information is that we identified that there are seven main areas of importance that came out for the drivers, and we were able to group them into seven categories. And so some of these are um, sort of quite logical or intuitive. However, we now have the research to back this up, and that's an important thing in relation to how we can look at helping to implement solutions going forward to help keep drivers health uh, safety um, health, healthy at work and also on on the road and also as a person for themselves in, in um, to stay at work as well so the areas that were coming up was physical health and if you've been part of our recent seminars you would have seen some of the statistics around what were some of the main health conditions as well that were coming up and these will be on our website at drivinghealth.net where you can find all the replays of all the seminars and the webinars that we've done previously as well as the reports. It was physical health, mental health. So we looked at what was the psychological level of, uh, level of psychological distress going forward 
and how within the um, interviews, it was like, what were the coping mechanisms around this and how did drivers cope with this? And we're going to talk a little bit more to Rod and Trevor around this as well today. Then we looked at relationships, relationships with their colleagues, relationships with themselves, being on in, in the truck on, on long, uh, long haul periods of loneliness and isolation, relationships with their management, relationships with family, and how that was impacted as well. Then there was work conditions. And what were the actual conditions of the road, the weather, the truck, all of those types of things. In regulations, looking at how were the logbooks impacting what they needed to do, the, the whole sort of uh, regulatory thing of you have X number of hours to drive, yet if you pull into a parking bay and it's full of people who um, are already in there, either trucks or caravans or camper vans, and you can't actually park there, then drivers have that whole whole sort of conundrum of do I keep driving and risk a fine or do I park somewhere else and risk a fine? And, and, and it's that whole impact of the regulations on their day-to-day -day work as well. The environments, as I mentioned before, the, um, the environments of the weather, the road, the traffic, and also the attitudes, the attitudes of their management, the attitudes of the public coming forward. Now we know that to get a driver who's healthy, to stay healthy at work, we need to have some sort of balance across all of these seven areas. And that's a real tough call. But that's what we're looking at. How can we create some sort of solutions and some way of going forward so that we can have a little bit more of a balance going forward? Because many of the drivers were a little bit like this. Their physical health or mental health or relationships were really struggling. And so there, were, there was sort of an imbalance and it was like driving with a flat tire when there are compromises with their health and well-being. So within that we looked at some themes as well that were coming up and there was two, two themes that supported people's health and well-being and four that were creating a little bit of a risk or a barrier to having um, good levels of health and well-being for drivers. So some of the supportive Themes were around family connections, strong connections with spouse or partner, family members, strong connections with friends, sometimes the camaraderie of other drivers on the road, particularly some drivers were talking about how overnight when it was in the wee small hours of the darkness, they would often get on their radios and talk each other through to get to the depot safely. And then there was also around the more formal connections, the more formal supports where, where some people had access psychologists or the chaplains or EAP counsellors within their workplace or had been recommended and provided the information and the connections to other people, skilled health professionals who could help them with their mental health support and coping mechanisms going forward as well. So there were some great success stories that I got, got to hear around this, which was brilliant. The other part of the coping mechanisms were around those things like practicing of, of being in the moment and practicing gratitude. Some of the drivers said, I just drive and I just absolutely love seeing the sunrises as I'm driving or the scenery. I've got to see some incredible places across Australia. And they were really recognizing how important that was for them and their mental health going forward. Some of them identified a real optimistic mindset so that there was always a way to make something happen. There was always some sort of thing that they could do that was within their control, even though the regulations, the loading, unloading, the time delays, the road traffic, the uh, road works, all of those things were beyond their control. They found things that they could control within that, which was a, a real huge support for them going forward with their health and well-being. So some of the quotes that came up, just to illustrate some of these points as well, one of these um, from one of the drivers said, my wife and daughters are fantastic. I love them to bits. So that, so that is probably one of the best bits of medicine that I can take for my mental health. And he was saying how he connects with it at certain times of the day when he's on the road and, and has that absolute strong connection with what they're doing and, and, and the events and activities that they're doing throughout the week as well as when he can connect in the weekend. Another driver says the things I really like is the freedom and the freedom of doing what I want when I want 
and to be one with the elements. And he went on to say of the amazing scenery he's seen around Australia that he got the privilege to see because of his truck driving. One of the family members came um, stated about around that connection with the connection theme with her um, husband. We came to an agreement that if he's feeling frustrated or if, or if there's something that's really annoying him, then he takes a deep breath and he rings me and we talk it through. <laughs> so it was great because many of the drivers and the family members were saying that they, they support each other in different ways. And that isn't always the way for many of the drivers. Some of the drivers said, you know, my wife's busy. She's looking after the kids. She's doing all this stuff at home. She sees herself as a single mum and I come in in the weekends and there's that real conundrum that's, that's like suddenly we're co-parenting and then I'm there for 36 hours and then I go again and, and it disrupts the family life. So there was different components that were coming through as well, which is important to think about and consider. So some of the um, other themes that came up around the risk to health and well-being for drivers was around the compromised system support. So while, while connections and strong supports were a real support of health and well-being, the compromised support systems were also identified as well. And this was linked a little bit, they were talk, um, many people were talking about the male macho mentality and lack of trust that they had with each other or the management or with family, because it was like, I just can't be there. Like my wife had a, had a massive crisis in the, in the house and I just wasn't there. And so there's that guilt that's, that's linked to that at times when people take that on board. And then there's that whole thing of the transitions. Like I said, the, the, the partner often feels like they're a single parent and then the husband or partner comes back and things have to change and you're just getting used to each other again and then it moves again. Several drivers talked about the dealing with isolation. They found it really tough. And that was that time when the black dog, and that was a quote unquote, the black dog of depression uh, likes to come and mess with your thoughts and catastrophize things out of, out, of, uh, out of context. And many of the drivers talked about struggling with that. Unrealistic demands. So the demands placed on the person to be at a certain place in a certain time to deliver on time, the delays around that were huge for many people and they identified that. And the flow on effect that it had for their health, their well-being, their sleep, their lack of ability to then eat healthy because that pushed here or can't stop at the usual place there that has a healthy meal for them. And the external environment, as I said before, the extremities of the weather, the um, lack of facilities on the road, lack of access to healthy food on the road, those types of things. Financial pressures, there's, uh, there's slimmer and slimmer margins that are able to be costed into, into jobs going forward and it's having a flow on effect. And also the lack of recognition from the public and management around their job and how important it is for these professional truck drivers to be recognised, to be treated well, that they have this incredible, incredibly high demand job and role within society and many of us as public members do not necessarily treat them with respect or recognition. So some of the driver quotes, if you're out there, you're on your own. It's the isolation. And this particular person really, were really struggling with that. There's a pressure put upon you by your employer to meet the schedules that they impose. And sometimes those were not necessarily very um, very able to be very sensible. <laughs> were able that some of them were not able to be actually met. The biggest health issue is that drivers for drivers now is not about being physically healthy. It's about mental health. It's the morale. And, and this person who had been in the industry for many years has seen it decline over the last few years, particularly. Family member talked about how the partner would come home with a short fuse and not realise that was part of their mental health. And then there was another one that said we went and talked with the management, but basically it was like, oh, information, can't do anything about that. So there was this whole lack of feeling powerful and lack of, um, lack of being able to control the situation on a broader context. So this is just to identify that these two things, those connections, and having different specific ways of coping were really good 
for the drivers and then there's a whole lot of other things that were stacking up that were making it harder for them to be healthy and stay healthy at work. So the possible solutions, we're going to explore these a little bit more today. But what has come out very strongly over the last three years of studies and all of the different studies that we've been involved with is that we must have a multi-pronged approach. And one family member stated this very clearly, it has to be a multi-pronged approach. It has to be industry coming to the table. They have to be willing with government to spend money on this. We cannot just target the drivers. The drivers are doing an absolute amazing job with the tools that they have. And as you saw back at that wheel, there's seven different components that involve and, and impact their health and well-being, and many of those are beyond the control of the driver. So as I mentioned before, this is the drivinghealth.net website, and we'll, we'll let you know a little bit more about that at the end, that you can find all of this information in depth. This is a very quick overview. These are our partners that we'd like to really thank, Centre for Health, Work, Health and Safety, Lynn Fox and the Transport Workers Union. And now we have got um, Rod. Whoops, no, Rod, yes. <laughs> We've got Rod Hanafi coming up in just a moment to tell us a little bit about his uh, experiences as a professional truck driver. And then that will be followed by Trevor Warner. And then we'll be all back together. So stay tuned. We'll be back real soon. G'day, my name's Rod Hanafi. Uh, I'm a full-time truck driver, uh, but I'm a road safety and road transport advocate. Uh, been in the industry now for geez, 40, 50 years. And I am very much involved in uh, trying to see change in our industry. Uh, I, I write a column for owner driver. I do spots on radio, and I'm also the president of National Road Freighters and an ambassador for Health in Gear. So another uh, group that is trying to improve safety, particularly mental health and physical for drivers. It's something that, that hasn't really been addressed. Uh, I remember being in the truck 10 years ago and driving into a cotton gin and there was an announcement on the radio that they'd suddenly found out that mental health was an issue for truck drivers. Now, in that time, nothing has really changed until recently. There is now a much bigger focus on mental health. But it's been something that we've been doing all on our own. Uh, you spend so much time on your own alone in the truck. And if you've got those couple of mates that you can talk to if you need a voice, if you've got family you can talk to, that's really good. But if you don't have them, where do you go? So I listen to a lot of audio books. Uh, that, that's my sort of entertainment, I suppose. But I'm very much involved in industry associations and trying to see change. We currently have a Heavy Vehicle National Law Review underway. I've contributed to that. I'm taking part in these podcasts. And, and some of the things that Elizabeth spoke of, like one of the things is that so many things that affect my ability, not only to manage my fatigue, but to stay safe, to stay healthy, to have any sort of, I suppose, communication with others or um, really positive talks or someone to talk to, is that all of the things that affect that ability are out of my control. So yes, we must have laws, but they're not flexible enough. We need rest areas to have places that we can get good shade and good sleep to, to get do that. It is really hard to get good food on the road and COVID has made such an enormous impact even over what it was a hard job before. They took away our roadhouses, we fought to get them back, some places aren't there now. Uh, the, the job has changed. Years ago, you, you worked 100 hours a week and you ate big, and now you don't do that. We've got forklifts and some blokes still eat big. So there are so many factors and so many things over which I can't immediately control, but I hope through these podcasts and, and other avenues, we will find some of those solutions and we will help many drivers who need that help, because at the moment they're on their own, that uh, we can provide that and make them safer and healthier out on the road. And coming up next, we've got Mr. Trevor Warner. Thank you. Hello, my name's Trevor Warner. Um, I've been back on the road uh, this time now for uh, about 15 years. Prior to that, I was um, running around doing all the, the local pickups and uh, 
bringing the freight back, consolidating it onto the interstate trucks and um, seeing, the, seeing the interstate boys head off to uh, predominantly it was fresh produce at the time. Uh, 100 hours a week uh, was, a, was a pretty pretty average sort of a week. Um, when I come back onto the road, uh, I noticed that we were, we were working, still working big hours. Um, drivers had issues with uh, access to information. So uh, one of the big ones at the time was, uh, was wages. So I, uh, I got, my, got my teeth into the Fair Work um, Ombudsman and, and the processes at the Fair Work Commission. Uh, I was helping drivers out. Uh, I started up a, a Facebook page uh, for the driver's advocate just to try to be some sort of intermediary there that where it was just there was just a huge gap in the information flow um, and the, the technology changed as well. So I've tried to help out there. Um, one of the uh, the NTC uh, inquiries around about 2009, 2010, just after these new fatigue laws come in, uh, I put in some submissions to that voicing my uh, my challenges uh, one of the um, journalists obviously thought what I had to say was pretty important and they picked up an article and published that in the uh, Australasian transport news in 2010 um, typically my uh, my sector that I operate in is, is fairly high risk uh, I'll do um, I'll do produce down to down to Sydney and Melbourne um, get to bed at the wee hours of the morning sleep late into the morning and then sit around Melbourne or sit around the cities all day uh, and then do overnight express back. So that has created some very unique, unique challenges for me that I had to learn to manage. Um, you know, the old, the old idea of um, come on, suck it up, harden up, take a, take a glass full of concrete and that, that sort of rubbish. Um, you know, that works for a while, but there's, there's got to be real reasons and there's no, there's no real place that you can you can find that. YouTube now is getting really good. We're getting a lot of drivers coming on channels, so uh, that that that's helped our information flow. Um, my uh, advocacy uh, sort of led me into the TWU. Uh, I had some issues, legal issues, and they just said, "Look, unless you remember, we're not interested." So I joined the TWU. I joined the NRFA um, for the same uh, reason to get access to politicians and try and sort out some of these challenges because. Uh, where uh, once you get on that merry-go-round of legal changes, um, there really is no help. So you've got to get get in there and um, and get yourself known. So and that's what's led me here to today. And welcome back. And it's so exciting for me to be able to talk in person with Rod and Trevor, the movers and shakers of the solutions going forward. I, I was just very exciting to hear both of you, how involved you are in associations and the industry and, and putting in submissions and ab absolutely committed to making a difference for drivers coming forward, yourselves and also the next generations coming through. It's so exciting. So we're going to spend a few minutes now. We're going to have a, um, some time that's going to be set specifically to ask you some questions, more so around some of the possible solutions from your perspective going forward about how we could do this. So the first question I'm going to put to you, Rod, first, and I'm going to get you both to talk about this a little bit. What's the biggest change that you've seen in the past five years that impacts your ability to be healthy and stay healthy? As a, as a professional truck driver? Certainly it's, it's the quality of food, the access to food on the highway, uh, and, and then the ability to be able to manage my fatigue. So we know that what you put into your body, it, it controls how well it operates, and then how you treat it controls how well it serves you. So if you, you can't get decent food, and then even look, one of the things where we have, if, if I buy food on the road, I can claim that as meals, but if I buy that food before I leave to go on the road, I can't. So, you know, when we talk to our politicians, and I know you'll be talking to Glenn Stirl, uh, our allowance, they tried to cut our meal allowance in half a couple of years ago, and yet the politicians went up, and geez, they're sitting in Parliament House with everything you want from Cordon Bleu right down to, to wine, and we can't get a decent meal on the road. So that's, that's dropped away, and COVID had a further impact. Uh, the mateship on the road has dropped out. It's, it's very hard now because of the fines and the penalties and the level of pressure under which you operate. 
it's one thing to say is, is one of your, your drivers said, oh, I'm out here on my own boss. That's a lovely theory. But it's so far from reality. You've got the boss. Then you've got the customer who expects the freight delivered yesterday for nothing. Then you've got the authorities who want you to do it their way. And I understand the intent of the law and we must have laws but they don't include enough truck drivers into in setting those laws up and making sure they're workable. And that's a problem. And then of course, you've got the public mm. who hear all bad things about us. They're told that we don't do the right thing and we're portrayed badly. And then they reflect that back in the way they treat us on the road. And it is mm. our lives at risk on the road, both from the public and the authorities and even the roads themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Huge, pro- huge, huge impacts that's fantastic that it's not fantastic that it's happening but it's that you're able to voice that and we're able to recognize those things as as changes in the industry and Trevor what about you what other changes you mentioned some of them so what other change what are the other biggest changes that you've noticed in the last five years probably the big one would be drivers drivers attitude we sort of we've got this old school crew that um, we basically we are our own boss. We only we only ring our employer when we're absolutely uh, in in dire need. Um, you know I carry all my own tools and everything now, and I actually had a breakdown the other week, and um, you know two or three drivers come over uh, t- to give me a hand, and um, they had some tools that I didn't have, some of the new um, electric uh, rattle guns and all that sort of thing. Um, that's that's old school um, camaraderie now on the and that was out west. Now you come over on the east coast, the Hume and the Pacific. Um, a most of the schedules don't allow uh, you to help to pull up and help somebody. Uh, the location, you know, you could you could pull up to help, and all of a sudden you're part of the casualty if something goes wrong. So you've you've got this old school mentality, and the, and the new drivers that come in that um, they're copping it every which way because they're not as skilled and. So you've got this great big divide, um, and it's uh, uh, sadly it's getting worse. Um, it's, it's it's terrible. You know, I uh, I've got two fridge freezers in the truck now. Um, I, I just I just found that the hours that I uh, that I kept, I really couldn't get access to um, to good food. It was all uh, fried um, pies, uh, sugary drinks, all that sort of thing. It doesn't matter how hard you try. Even some of the waters these days has got sugar in it. So I've um, I leave home with um, two freezers, two fridges full, and one freezer underneath the bunk. Um, so if I do get stuck somewhere, it really doesn't bother me. But um, the other night I, I needed to pull up, and I was nearly out of hours, and uh, I, I just there was there was no space. So I travelled 200 kilometres um, before I could get to the next parking bay, mm. um, and I. I I complained about it to a politician and um, it's like, yeah, yeah, we, we, we know about that. We're, we're getting there. But they said the same thing 10 years ago. Mm, exactly. So, That's what Rob was saying as well. It's like there's, there's many things that you've, you've um, like the, around mental health and things as well. It's like there's an issue a decade ago and it's still an issue now. So what are we doing about it? So we're going to shift tack a little bit into into identifying some of your ideas about what we can do about it and so one of those things I think would be really useful to find out is like how do you deal with being being on the road and the stress of being on the road like we've we've touched on and literally only just touched on many many components and impact factors but how do you how do each of you deal with the stress of being on the road we'll start with you Trevor this time uh for me I've um I've been in small business for quite some time. I, um, my first small business, I was, I was 21 years old and uh, that was going really good. And then Mr. Keating's recession hit and I was in a regional area and our, our sales just fell away. So I've always been a little bit of an entrepreneur. So, you know, I've, I've, I've had three cracks at small business and I've lost everything three times. So I'm, um, I've really had to dig deep to find, um, my way out of it and I've been able to do that with with YouTube and and um, just I've spoke to one professional once and you know that really didn't help uh, I've, I've worked out my own tools and I actually get drivers ringing me now um, whether it's relationship issues or whatever because uh, I've been there and done that um, but I'm, I'm always uh, hungry for information I think I'm up to about 170 titles on my uh, audible um, program awesome. uh, account so um, 
psychology and political stuff and uh, and, and all that sort of thing. Um, I'm happy in my own company. I'm more than happy to run from North Queensland through to Melbourne or North Queensland to Perth and just pull up in the middle of nowhere and just sit there in the peace and quiet and listen to the birds. Um, and, yeah, just don't get caught up in the, in the rubbish on the highway. And uh, I've had to, with what I said before, with the high-risk work that I do, um, I've really had to get in touch with anxiety and, um, and sleep patterns. So I've spent probably the last three years educating myself on the science behind that. So I get to understand uh, if, if this happens and you get a short fuse, well, you've obviously got a, a few chemicals not quite in balance up top. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm very aware of that where um, I know one of our uh, fellow drivers here, he, he couldn't manage that recently and had a big blow up and, um, you know, he found himself on the wrong side of the law and um, on the wrong side of his relationship. So, wow, um, wow you know, that's amazing you've, that you've um, developed these these tools. That's fantastic. And now you're sharing them with other people as well. That's awesome. Thank you, Trevor. Yeah. Brilliant. And Rod, what about you? How do you deal with the stresses of being on the road? Uh, as I say, audio books are my entertainment, and, and Trevor mentioned Audible. So uh, there are still drivers that don't know about audio books. Uh, it's information, it's, it's education, it is entertainment. Uh, the other part of it is, is trying to find ways to fix things. Like I'm in Perth now and I rang the road authority yesterday and put in a complaint about a section of road that nearly tore the steering wheel clean out of my hand. Now they don't know about those things and we as drivers, they, they do affect our ability to remain safe. And if, if a driver then rings up, and if only one bloke rings up, well, you're a whinging truck driver. But if five ring up about something that's really serious, you don't ring up about a divot the size of your thumb. But if it's dangerous, someone sitting in Perth doesn't know about that bit of road at Meckering. And that's part of what I do. And then the other part is writing column and doing a weekly blog. And, and I now have a Facebook page that reviews those audio books because I had drivers say, well, that's handy. You know, what do you listen to? Can you make any recommendations? And it's being involved in things like this uh, with Health and Gear. Uh, I'm on a panel with Healthy Heads and Trucks and Sheds. And look, one of the things they're doing is looking at the perfect rest area. Now, that's really good to have one perfect rest area, but we need a lot more little ones for a bloke that's tired out there because one rest area in Brisbane is no good to a bloke that's in the, in the Northern Territory. So we have so much to change. We have so much to do. Many drivers and I got onto a mate. I said, oh, look, this inquiry's coming up. Would you put in a submission? He said, yes. At the end of it, they said, uh, that's it. And he said, oh, hang on, I've got these diagrams. They said, oh, but you didn't mention them. Your 45 minutes is up. Uh, sorry, you missed out. And he said, don't you ever ask me to contribute again. So getting people involved is hard. Getting them to accept that people will listen is even harder. And the other thing that I do now, I've um, because of our unusual sleep times, Whilst I listen to audio books on the road, I read when I go to bed. And that be, that's become my trigger. So I might only read two pages, but my body says, ah, oh, understand, it's now time for bed. If you're not quite that tired, you read a bit more. And you've got to have those things because of our unusual hours and where you are. And sometimes it's hot, it's cold and all those things. Um, reading's become my trigger for bed. And that's worked very well. Awesome. That's fantastic. So within both of what you've said, there's a whole lot of amazing tools and tips for how you cope with things on the road. It's brilliant. And as you said before as well, Trevor, in relation to the food, you've got you've got two fridges and freezers now to have more food. And in relation to sleep, I love that, that you've identified that for you, Rod, you have a, the book. So you're actually creating sleep hygiene principles on the road it's like when I read a book it means I'm going to sleep <laughs> even if it's four o'clock in the morning or two o'clock in the afternoon this is brilliant so these are some of the, the strategies that you put in place and we'll talk a bit more about those in the Q&A as well so just before we go to Q&A and look at the any questions that are coming through from the panel audience and remember if you're on here and you're listening make sure you click the ask a question button and pop your question in there. We're going to Q&A very shortly. So what's the one thing for each of you? What's the one thing that you think needs to be addressed first? I know there's a plethora of things that, that need to be addressed. Many, many things. And we've touched on many of them today. What's the one thing that you think needs to be addressed first? And how could we do that? We're just going to have like a minute each. <laughs> I'll start with you, Rod. What's the one thing? And how could we actually approach that? 
the one thing is the flexibility in the logbook. It's black and white. It's written in law. The penalties are onerous. The stress of complying with those are onerous. Uh, I'm currently involved in a heavy in a fatigue review panel with NHVR. They're looking at a trial that might test some of those things. Uh, some drivers can deal with electronic work diaries. They will help some, but not all. And as part of that, it's getting more drivers involved. It's fantastic that Trevor and I get to have a say here, but I was on a phone hook up the other day for an hour and there's probably only 10 people are gonna get that chance. And that's not enough. We need more drivers involved. They're the ones doing it. They have the solutions. And I suppose that the second thing is definitely as part of that is the rest areas. It's getting rest areas provided for us because there are not enough. And these people that think technology is gonna solve our problem, technology doesn't provide you with a rest area or somewhere to go to bed and that's critical mm. and like trevor said before he drove 200 kilometers now you'll be way over your hours and the fine would be huge but it's yeah. like what else are you supposed to do yeah that's that's amazing thank you rod and trevor what's the one thing for you and how could we address that do you think that's really important up there for you um it's probably uh there's a couple of points but they all they all in integrate um, one of the things is uh, obviously what Rod, Rod said is parking bays. We've got parking bays out on the road, but also in, in the cities. You, you know, I, I drove around four truck stops in Melbourne there a while ago. A, I was, I was hungry. B, I needed a shower. I needed to go to the toilet and I needed to sleep. Uh, I had four truck stops. So I eventually got something, um, but I was, I was out of hours. I, was, I should have been pulled up 20 minutes before, but um, th th those are things that we do. But um, so we need to address the, the, the parking and in, in the cities, the parking out on the highways. And one of the things that I put to the, the Fair Work Commission was um, the, the companies and the governments uh, or, the, or the Fair Work Commission is very quick to pull money out of our wages. But it, it's that money that keeps all the truck stops afloat. If, if they can't make a dollar out of something, they're not going to do it. So we're seeing good food places and good truck stops in ideal locations disappearing because they're not viable. Mm, yeah, and like you said, the, the impact of COVID as well. So other places, they weren't open during COVID because they were in lockdown, mm. but the truckies are still on the road and even more so because there was much more to deliver. And yet, um, like you were saying, the, the impact of um, COVID was, was that some places have even disappeared and no longer there. So these are huge, huge um, factors that we need to consider and absolutely looking forward to the next little bit of where we get to answer some of the questions from you out there, the listeners. So we'll be back in just a moment and Ting's going to give us some questions from the audience and then we'll go from there. Thank you, Elizabeth, Rod and Trevor for bringing us a valuable discussion today. So now we come to the Q&A uh, question or discussion session. Um, there is a question about, you know, like a COVID. So we all know like the COVID lockdown increased the demand of transport industry and, you know, put on additional pressure on your time schedule. So just wondering how the COVID impact of your time schedule and also the psychological distress. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll make a comment on that. Um, the, the fact is we had a national transport protocol that all the states then decided to ignore, brought in their own laws, they changed them overnight. You'd get to a border and find that they changed the law on the way there. Uh, one bloke sat in a queue and got to the New South Wales Victorian border at midnight, got to five past 12, he finally got to the thing and the bloke said, oh, your permit ran out at 11.59. And he said, but you, where have I been? You, you've seen, I've, I've, no, no, you've got to sit there and reapply. So they made him sit there and hold everyone else up to reapply online to get a permit. And then of course, because they'd been in that queue for four hours, no toilets, no food, no facility, no consideration, every truck stop was full for the next four hours. So, so many people had to drive on illegal and that was done without any consideration of our physical health, our mental health, our ability to, to comply with the law. And, and geez, look, people say, 
when everybody ran out of toilet paper, all of a sudden people understood that trucks deliver everything to everybody in Australia. And they say it now, but they don't really recognise, one, what we contribute to their way of life, and two, what we give up out of our own ways of life to make them have that. So COVID just put so much extra pressure. Some people wouldn't get vaxxed and they left the industry. People sold their trucks. And now we've been operating virtually at capacity for two years and there's a lot of blokes out there nearly at the end of their tether. And that worries me uh, more than anything now. Yeah. That's what I'm hearing uh, with the with the resurgence of these cases. Um, it, it's the it's not so much the the disease or the virus itself. It's the um, it's the chain of responsibility protocols that get put in place and the impact on on the drivers. Um, they would it's almost to the point where if, if they bring all this nonsense back in again, um, and we certainly can't see any uh, any improvements between communication of the states. Um, they're just going to sit home. We've already got drivers that refuse to go to Woolworths in um, in Sydney because of the protocols that are that were in place there. Um, let alone the, the 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 new technological way of of accessing these sites. Um, they're using technology to to uh, take over from paperwork, and you, you've got drivers that are still using the old push button, um, big key phones, and um, that they, they've been told that. Uh, they uh, they can't deliver their load because they don't have a smartphone and a and a, a particular app and, and let alone know how to use it. It's just um, yeah, it's really testing the uh, the patience of drivers. Huge. Thank you both. Uh, another question related to the mental health, as you mentioned, Rod, um, you said like one dri one the truck driver. Um, facing the mental health issues. Sometimes they just address those issues by themselves. It also, we have published a study. So, um, the findings suggest that, you know, try, like one driver, uh, drivers have mental health issues, they rather to seeking the help from their peer drivers or family support, but not, you know, seeking help from, you know, professional, um, Health, like doctors. So, from your perspective, so what's your suggestion or advice for drivers and also for um, the organizing organization level for your management level? Yeah, you mentioned there that the blokes don't go to doctors. We we know that. Uh, if you've got a couple of good mates on the road, and look, I had a mate, uh, and we used to ring up and talk two or three times a week, and, and our longest conversation went for three and a half hours. And we discussed the meaning of life and, and everything. And, and unfortunately, he passed away. He, uh, he passed away recently. So that was really sad. Uh, if you've got those couple of people, they're very rare and they're very hard to get to. If you've got family, yes, but family don't understand the job a lot of the time. And I, I fear that in that professional network, whilst uh, Health and Gear now have someone where you can ring in, but that's only from eight till five, and yes, many people know of Lifeline and Beyond Blue, but those people aren't truck drivers. Now, I'm not saying they don't have the skills they need, but they might not have the understanding where a driver can ring them up, say, look, this is how I feel. I'm in the middle of nowhere, I've broken down, my wife's run off with the dog and, and the house has fallen down and my kids have gone berserk. And they're gonna say, oh, that's really sad, Rod. You know, this is what you wanna do. Well, are they got any idea what it's like when you are never there? And that puts so much more pressure on you. Um, there's, you. You can't run a family by phone. It's one thing to say you can ring your wife and say goodnight each night. Or, and look, yesterday I rang every one of my children because I haven't been home for two weeks. And, and I try and keep in touch. But I, I was talking to a driver a while ago and he said he still carries the guilt now, 10 years after getting off the highway, for never being there for his wife and his children. And, and you can't do this job without doing that. And yes, you might get paid a reasonable amount of money, but the money doesn't cover the way that you live, the food that you eat, the sleep that you miss out on, the way that you're treated by customers and the like. And, and you mentioned in the unpaid waiting time. Now you go somewhere and they say, be here at three, Rod, and you get there at three and at 3.30 say, what's going on? Oh, it won't be long. 
at four o'clock you walk over, what's going on, mate? Oh, the book is flat, yeah, we'll be with you. An hour and a half later, you could have had an hour's kip if they'd have told you, but now you're stuck there and they still expect you there in the morning. So we are badly treated and not recognised and that just adds more pressure to those shoulders and they carry a lot of weight. We've got a million dollar truck and a million dollar load and yet you still have to manage all of these things yourself. So it's really hard to get people that understand and can provide you with good advice. Yeah, valid points. And I think I think um, just before you answer the same question, Trevor, um, I think from the interviews, there was, I think there was four or maybe five people who said that they actually um, went and sought help from a health professional. So a psychologist or psychiatrist mainly. And they found that 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 experience, I know Trevor, you said it wasn't that useful for yourself, but that these people said that that was incredibly useful and helped them at that time of crisis. And and that, that was really heart, heartwarming to hear that, that, that there are some truckies out there that have had really good experiences, which is great to hear. And they encourage other people to, to um, sort of reach out and find the professional services that may be of help to them. However, around that, I understand that there's there's still this this whole, as I said in some of the research on one of the page of slides, this whole male macho thing and the 0800 harden up, drink a cup of concrete, like you said, Trevor, <laughs> mm. is has been sort of the culture of of the whole truck driving culture. And it's really tough to break that through and saying that when you ask for help, it's a sign of strength. It's not a sign of weakness. So Trevor, how, how else could we potentially address this whole thing of mental health for the individual drivers and the organizations? Well, it's a real tough one because we're, we're all different. We've all got, all got different factors. Um, my last business that I was involved with um, was we were talking a lot of money and when it, uh, and when we run out of capital, so to, to so to speak, it was that was a real dark day for me. It took me five years from that day to actually get my head straight. I went back on the road. Um, and I, that's when I spoke to uh, a professional, and, and they just couldn't grasp the, the concept that I was in. Like we were talking huge incomes, and um, and then we're right. That's when I first discovered corporate corruption and so forth. But that's a different story. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I had to deal with that as well, the, the injustice. Actually, that was the big one, the injustice. And I found that uh, I discovered that I had, um, I had big ambitions and I, um, I drilled down, it took me five years to drill down that it was expectation. If I can control my expectation, and now my wife's actually doing the same thing, she understands what I, what I mean now, uh, that's how what keeps us together. Um, we're all on the same page. I, I come off the road to spend more time at home but the income went down and I actually, I was actually, we, our relationship was worse uh, because of, uh, I had to work longer hours um, and th that communication fell apart. So then she's, you know, I decided, we decided I, I'll go back on the road. So to try and explain that to somebody, um, they, they kind of got to live through it. Um, but I, I have found that um, the other drivers, uh, other drivers and, and if there's management there that used to be a driver that's now more in um, as a supporting role, uh, like um, what uh, health, health and gear and, and healthy trucks and sheds, you know, you've got a bit of transport background there. So those types of people can actually understand what, what you mean and um, they, don't, they, don't, uh, they don't charge as much as the professionals either. But to get people to take that step forward yeah, that's 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 a really big one. I, I actually don't know how. You've, I had to find the motivation within myself to do it. No one encouraged me to do it, but I'm very analytical. If there's a problem, I'll, I'll troubleshoot it. I'll mull something over for, for weeks to find a solution. Um, other people just lash out and some people just bury it. And then when the black dog bites them on the bum, it's, uh, it, it's potentially too late. So I, I, just, I just think keep chipping away at... Um, at getting the message out there. Mm. And I, I know that we had um, Naomi um, Fraunfelder on, on 
uh, last two weeks ago, and she's from the CEO of Healthy Hedge and Traction Sheds. And I know that their emphasis is absolutely, let's do something about this, let's make a change, let's not just keep talking about it for the next decade. And I know that there's a whole lot of resources and potential solutions and interactions and connections that that are, are beginning to happen around that and like for both of you, you you've said you've got facebook pages and youtube things and and you're, you're connecting people with information to hopefully turn this around i think it's fantastic to hear that mm. can i just add one other thing um anxiety there needs to be a focus on anxiety getting helping drivers to understand anxiety uh, in, in the early days, I, I had an operations manager and he was a regional manager and he went, he went out of his way to make things difficult. And I lost my shit one, sorry, I lost it one night and uh, grabbed him by the scruff and uh, I ended up with an assault charge and that was, and the boss just said, hey, look, I, want us, I wanted to thump him as well, but we can't do that. What went wrong? And when I explained it, he's, he's just, yeah, the guy was sacked within, uh, within a couple of days of the boss finding out exactly what he was doing uh, and I'm seeing that around the place now where you'll go into places and um, everybody wants to be right uh, everybody wants to be um, you, you need to be a mind reader to understand what's going on in the in, in the workplace um, and if you upset the routine so to speak all of a sudden everyone's in your face um, and your anxiety levels just go through the roof so there needs to be some mechanism there within management to ring up and go um, hey, look, this is a problem. I can't deal with this. Um, and I'm not seeing that. I'm not seeing that in the workplace. Because mm. you kind of get the same rub rubbish from management sometimes because they're old school truckies that just have moved up the ranks and now they're calling the shots. Mm. And the other side to that is you've got to find someone you can talk to. It, it is hard and, and not everybody's capable. Uh, are you okay, Dave? Those things are really good, but you need to find that mate. You can at least ask, mate, if you've got a minute to chat and then you need to look after those people that ask you. Uh, we have another question about what are some of the ways you prioritise your health on the road? Especially uh, your physical health. Mm -hmm. um, for me, I've, uh, I love the... Um, the YouTube commentary from, from doctors to get different things. I've actually, uh, at the moment, I'm off sugar, I'm off carbs. I've got a, I'm, I'm, I've got a bit of a belly that I'm trying to control. Uh, I've come, I've come from about a hundred and I'm, I'm six foot two. Uh, I've gone from 130 kilos. I'm floating around. Uh, I'm fairly stable at 115 kilos now. Mm. Um, I'm kind of more leaning towards uh, the ketogenic diet at the moment, but that's, that's just simple. That's just meat and vegetables. You know, M mum was right after all. <laughs> uh, Love it. <laughs> so you know get away from the fried food um and well the big thing is is probably the first six weeks of going going in to pay for your fuel and next minute oh mars bars are two bucks ice breaks are, are two for two for three dollars and when you look at the sugar content you you um yeah you've, you've really got to make a conscious decision of getting used to drinking your coffee without sugar um leaving those chocolate bars there get away from the the drink fridge you know, um, of one of the studies that I read was um, the Super Soldier Program over in America, and that's when I first understood that hey, drugs are great, but humans have got a problem of um, slipping into habits, and that's when it all goes pear shaped. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, what I'm seeing now is drivers going into truck stops and they're walking out with six ice breaks and a four pack of V just to drive 800 kilometres from Melbourne to Sydney. Um, you know, if those guys aren't diabetics by the time they're 50, 55, I'll, I'll, uh, I don't know when it'll happen. Mm. So, yeah, it, it takes a conscious thing, but it, the information's there. Um, the drivers just need to be, need to be willing uh, to, to go and do it. But the one message that I'd like to put across is my wife's in aged care. Um, she took this driver, ex-truck driver, he's 50 years driving a truck, loved it. Um, couldn't wait to retire got his super, uh, had his four-wheel drive and fishing boat. And uh, a couple of months after finishing work, he was on his way to the hospital to have his lower legs amputated. Mm. And, that, and that was purely through the, the trucking industry, the lack of, lack of movement uh, and poor diet. Mm. And that, that really shocked me. Actually, I just thought, you poor bugger. Mm. Um, 
And so all, what do you do around activity then, Trevor? What what works for you or some of the people that you know? What do they do around to increase that that level of physical activity? Most of the guys I know will uh, will pull up. They will get their little uh, little twenty dollar gas burner out. They'll put their kettle on and uh, fill it fill it um, up a fair way, and then they'll walk around the truck. Now I'm twenty six meters long and. 2.5 meters wide so let's call it 65 meters sometimes i might do 10 laps wait, waiting for that uh, kettle to boil mm -hmm. and um that's it and that does two things that it, it clears the brain fog so when you get back in you're actually reasonably alert uh, you get that blood flow from your legs back up to your heart where, where it needs to be um you know out west it's hot and there's flies but when you get back in the cool truck it's sort of it's, it's not too bad but there's no reason oh, and i've got some dumbbells that i i walk around and just work my arms because most of us truckies have got sore shoulders or damaged shoulders um and i just do that otherwise you, you, your shoulders do get weak and uh, you end up hurting your back which i've explained to dr isles before yeah um yeah and that's uh anybody can do that and it's free you don't you don't need a gym membership Awesome, awesome. And Rod's joining us back. This is a this is a um, occupational hazard, isn't it, Rod? That um, you break down and the internet jumps out, or the phone lines jump out, and so you lose contact with the world. Are you able to? We're just talking a little bit about what each of you do to support your own physical health, and what do you do around physical activity? Have you um, have you got the opportunity to contribute to that as well? Uh, look, eat what you eat on the road and, and how you eat. Like, I, I, as I say, one of the things, the problem with our laws are that if you buy stuff on the road, and we know how hard it is to get good food, but if you buy it before you go on the road, you can't class that as your meals for living away. So that, that's got to be addressed properly. Um, I try and remain reasonably fit. I, I do push-ups every morning. I do a deep breathing of a night. Uh, I take supplements a little bit just to sort of top up uh, for those things that you miss out on. And I, I do try and, and walk. Um, I, I have to load and unload my own truck. So that keeps a bit of that there. And there are a few people that, that do exercises. I carry a little dumbbell in the truck. So try and do those things. I don't go overboard, but it's like anything. You must manage it. You must be aware of what responsibilities you have to yourself. Because if you don't eat properly, you don't sleep properly, then you can't do the job and you put yourself and others at risk. And of course, the, the reason that we all do this job is to get home to a family that we, we miss so much and to look after them. So you've got to manage it properly. Thank you, Rod. Okay, guys, uh, because of the time uh, limit, uh, we have to finish the Q&A session. And I believe all of our audience have been enjoying the seminar today. And we will come back in a second for wrapping up of today's seminar. Thank you. Good afternoon again, everyone. Thank you for attending our fifth driving house event in the 2022 Healthy Working Life Seminar Series. Our last driving house, uh, driving house seminar is in this Wednesday at 12 to 2 a.m. at Melbourne time. In our last seminar, Senator Glenn Sterrell will join us to discuss the topic on where to from here and a possible solution session. Our presenter, including Driving House team, Ross Elizabeth and myself, and Jiron Kaslik and Ruth Ogden from Toll. We will have also the virtual networking se session at our last seminar from 1 p.m. to 2 p.m. And you will have the chance to ask questions to the Driving House team. For more information on the Driving House project, please go to Driving House. Donat. Hope to see you there. Bye.